Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tokyo College webinar. My name is Flavia Baldari, a project researcher here at Tokyo College, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, one quick remark for the audience. If you prefer to listen to today's lecture in Japanese, please select the Japanese to live English um, to Japanese interpretation at the bottom of your screen. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Jennifer Robertson. Today, she will give a talk titled Securitainment, Triangulation of Embodied AI, Entertainment and Surveillance. Jennifer Robertson is a visiting professor at Tokyo College, Professor Emerita at the University of Michigan. She defines herself as a historical and visual anthropologist, anthropological historian, and art historian. She has an incredible list of publications, including seven books, over 90 articles and chapters addressing a broad spectrum of interdisciplinary subjects from the uh, 17th century to the present. Her primary area of specialty is Japan, but her topics of research include nativist and social uh, rectification movements, agrarian, agrarianism, sex and gender system and ideologies, mass and popular culture, the place of Japan in anthropology, theater and performance, eugenics and bioethics, and technology and robotics. She was also at Tokyo College last year, and she gave a talk on effective, effective robotics in Japan. The lecture video is on Tokyo College YouTube channel, so please check it out. Today, she will present her new and ongoing research in which she explores how and why AI-enabled entertainment and surveillance technologies have become fused, and she speculates on the consequences on this relationship. A commentary by Professor Itatsu Yuko will follow today's lecture. Professor Itatsu is a social and cultural historian specializing in media, leisure, and power. Her interests are in politics of everyday practices during leisure time, including engagement with media technology. She works on exclusionary and inclusive practices towards marginalized population in society. She is affiliated with the Be, uh, Beyond AI Global Forum. Beyond AI is a co-organizer for today's event. Uh, Beyond, Global, uh, Beyond AI Global Forum is a research group founded uh, by the Institute for AI and Beyond and the University of Tokyo. They are interested in social implication of AI in everybody li everyday life and focus primarily on its impact when trying to achieve gender equal society that guarantees minority rights. Please check, your, check their website beyondai.jp. After Professor Itatsu commentary, the remaining time will be uh, used for discussion. And if we have time at the end, we will have a short Q&A session. Professor Robertson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Flavia, uh, for your, let me just uh, share my screen here. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful introduction. And I'd like to begin with a big thank you to the following colleagues, Tokyo College Director Haneda Masashi for inviting me as a visiting professor, Professor Itatsu Yuko, who graciously agreed to serve as the commentator and whose important work on the impact of AI on leisure industries has been inspiring. Uh, professor, that's it, Sensei. <laughs> professor uh, Teriyama Junko for her uh, expert simultaneous translations uh, and in recognition of her important scholarship on learning disabilities. And you see her, her new book just came out. Dr. Flavia Baldari uh, for her expert organization of this uh, webinar. And of course, all the support staff at uh, Tokyo College. I also want to thank Professor Pierre Serna, professor of history at the Sorbonne and affiliate member of Tokyo College, whose invitation to contribute a chapter to his edited volume on animal human relations inspired the research beyond this, uh, behind this, uh, today's presentation. And I have one caveat. What I talk about today is just a very narrow slice of a larger project uh, on this topic. So let me begin. CCTV cameras are installed almost everywhere in Tokyo and other Japanese cities, first appearing in the 1970s as analog devices. Since the 1990s, most CCTV are digital and which today are wireless and cloud-based. As I'll be elaborating, surveillance or close observation has become a way of seeing and influences ways of being seen. 
I aim to show how entertainment robots, which can be understood as forms of embodied AI, have also been mobilized by their home companies as surveillance devices, in the sense that these robots supply a steady stream of biometric data to the companies and their affiliates. I'll be using Sony's robot dog, Eibel on the right, as a case study. My concluding remarks consider AI-based surveillance technology as the basis for an emerging type of capitalism that both enhances and supersedes neoliberalism. Now I've organized my talk into three parts. The first is a brief definition of AI, which I'm going to provide right now because it's not only central to my research and because AI tends to be used as if everyone already knows what it is. At its simplest form, artificial intelligence is comprised of groups of algorithms or computer codes, as you see in the image here, designed to solve problems targeted by human programmers, such as pattern recognition. These algorithms, and thus AI, are trained using massive data sets containing millions of images, text, sounds, languages, grammars, formulas, etc. The key term here is data sets which constitute the foundational layer that makes AI function. Generative AI, which is what chat GPT is, has been described as a giant plagiarism machine, as it mines data from the internet, among other sources, and responding to statistically quantifiable ways to specific questions and problems. So AI is a type of automation, and I'll have more to say about data further along. Now in the second part of my paper, I'll provide some background context and information on the practice of surveillance in Japan historically. And in the third part, I'll be examining Sony's AIBO, which for me epitomizes the fusion of embodied AI, entertainment, and surveillance. So let me begin with some backstory. Before CCTV, the earliest system of facial recognition took place in villages, small towns, and urban neighborhoods where individuals were constantly watched and were watchers themselves as they went about their daily lives. In the mid 1930s, a nationwide system of neighborhood organizations, Tonarigumi Chonaikai, was organized by the military state to function as a policing and crime prevention network and to monitor anti government activities. They continue to exist in post war Japan, and while neighborhood associations are no longer agents of the central government, they do function to coordinate social and civic activities and thereby enhance social cohesion and the community spirit. However, to make a long story short, since the turn of this century, interest in membership in the country's 300,000 neighborhood associations, Cholonaikai, has rapidly declined. Some factors cited for this trend have been depopulation in rural areas and within the suburbs and central urban centers, a growing indifference to neighborhood associations and community-based crime prevention measures. According to an NHK study conducted in 2015, membership rates now average 20% of a given population, down from 70 plus percent in the last century. Legal sociologist Yoshinaka Nobuhito from Hiroshima University attributes this trend to a decline in traditional modes of social cohesiveness. His recent field work also revealed that younger generations are unwilling or perhaps unprepared to participate in volunteer activities. And you see here a poster urging people to join HO Naikai, and it's from Hiroshima. Also worth pointing out is the widely cited post-war trend of the government emphasizing technological solutions to social problems, thus in a way contributing to the erosion of community values by prioritizing technology over in-person human-shaped society. And this emphasis is blatantly obvious in the Moonshot program. <clears throat> as uh, the Moonshot program, as described on the government's website, was inaugurated in 2020, and it augments the earlier Society 5.0, which succeeded Innovation 25, introduced by the late former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. Now, briefly, the vision is of a robot and AI enhanced society in which people's relationships, even in the home, are mediated by technological devices. 
including robots, as you can see here on every level of this building and in the surrounding environment. Instead of generating a community, much less familial spirit, the Moonshot program, like its predecessors, will likely encourage a type of media-defined and shaped hyper-individualism that, as Yoshinaka argues, has eroded traditional modes of social cohesiveness. And already individuals are, are increasingly forming deep, even intimate relationships with and through their electronic devices and social media. Of course, this is a topic of another webinar. But in this connection, public opinion surveys have revealed a growing fear among Japanese in the past two decades of technology-related crimes, such as identity theft and billing fraud. These types of crimes have also been enabled, have also been enabled by demographic trends, such as technologically naive and gullible elderly parents estranged for whatever reasons from their children who have been cheated out of their savings by scammers. And there are daily NHK or public TV shows on this trend. Uh, and you have here a, uh, a new spot saying, be on guard if you receive telephone calls that ask, are you home today? And a caller impersonating the son uh, tells his mother that uh, he's going to be coming back home. The mother responds, I'll be home later today. And the son, uh, alleged son, then says, well, I lost 4 million yen in the stock market. I can raise half of that, but can you lend me 2 million yen? And of course, the mother is shocked. And most recently, uh, there was a report focused on AI-generated deep fakes. And so you see here the announcer showing how generative AI produces deep fakes by combining biometric data. Uh, she gives the example of how AI has learned Biden's voice uh, in a fake video. And also lower left, how fake videos of TV announcers and even Prime Minister Kishida have been produced. And the very uh, last uh, image is, we need to inform our families and police uh, if any of this happens. So there's an attempt by uh, public TV to, uh, to raise an awareness of the abuses by AI. Now, curiously, the deadly sarin gas ter bioterror attack in March 1995 by the cult Om Shinikyo did not result in the installation of CCTV cameras in subways and trains. Rather, the very recent random knifings on the Shinkansen, or bullet train, and other trains, sensationalized in the mass media, prompted the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism just this past June to mandate the installation of security cameras on all new Shinkansen and new trains in Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya by last mm -hmm. September. It's already happened because about 60% of Tokyo Metro subway cars uh, have cameras, as do other uh, train lines. Now, incidentally, researchers have shown that there is little correlation between the number of surveillance cameras around and the crime rate. Broadly speaking, although in some cases, cameras may serve as a deterrent to some criminals, more cameras alone do not simply reduce crime rates or to stop crimes from happening. Rather, CCTV cameras provide visual and local data, locational data to help find and prosecute criminals after the fact. In addition to the ubiquitous presence of surveillance cameras on trains, streets, municipal and government buildings and elevators, it's also the case that private security systems introduced in the 1980s are now standard in most homes and small shops and businesses. As of 2021, there are at least, and probably more, than 5 million CCTV cameras installed indoors and outdoors in Japan, including on the ubiquitous vending machines. Now, in this connection, I attended the Creative Tech Expo or the Create Tech Expo last month, and the security cameras there provided the thousands of visitors, including myself, if you see, with entertaining surveillance videos. So this offered real-time PR for the exhibitors. Now, security and surveillance technologies and biometric identifiers have become so prevalent and banal that nobody questions their legitimacy and even their legality. In Japan, three buzzwords are most often used in putting a positive spin on such intrusive technologies, anshin, anzen, and bendi or peace of mind and comfort, anshin, a sense of safety and security, anzen, 
and convenience, bendy. And I have more to say about these buzzwords further along. <clears throat> I recently surveyed the crime prevention camera or Bohang Kamera section of the BIC camera department store in Yurakjo. And uh, in, in, in keeping with my secure attainment theme, I was really amused to find that the security cameras and toys are sold on the same floor. Now the cameras were priced from 3,000 to under 4,000 yen uh, to under 40,000 yen, roughly 20 to um, uh, 270 yen at today's rate, and some indoor high definition cameras priced in the uh, 10,000 yen or $70 range allow users to monitor pets and elderly residents well away from home through their smartphones. Some cameras can also detect movement, temperature, and recognize faces. And all those I saw at Big Camera are cloud based and accessible via smartphones. And you see here. Uh, that uh, these cameras are all cloud-based. Now, especially in urban areas like Tokyo, where monumental uh, ferro concrete high-rise apartment complexes called Danchi and Manchon house nuclear families in which both parents are working, security cam cameras double as techno lusuban. And lusuban, or house sitting, is the increasingly rare practice whereby a homeowner entrusts the care of keeping watch over a house to elderly parents or to someone trustworthy, sometimes a friendly neighbor. The impersonal environment of Danchi dwelling does not facilitate neighborliness and cylinder and deadbolt locks, in addition to intercom and video doorbells, typically provide protection from potential intruders. Not surprisingly, there are many busuban and mimamori or watching over robots on the market. They allow visual access through smartphones. In other words, they serve as an extra pair of eyes. Most are small and cute and immobile, and unlike some security cameras, do not make video recordings. Some of the more sophisticated busuban robots also double as entertainment robots. And this is the case with Sony's robot dog, Aibo. As we'll see, Ibo is basically an AI-enabled entertainment security or secure attainment robot. Ibo is also a prime example of the dominant trend in machine learning studies to think of artificial intelligence in terms of embodiment, from smartphones to all kinds of robots. AI enables robots to access and or to navigate their environments and to recognize patterns. Roboticists Rolf Pfeiffer and Josh Bongard make the compelling argument in their 2006 book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, that embodiment is an enabler or a prerequisite for any kind of intelligence. The real importance of embodiment, they point out, comes from the interaction between physical processes, gravity, friction, energy supply, and also from information processes. Now in humans, this concerns the relation between body and brain, in robots between its actions and control program. Pfeiffer and Bongard dismantle the widely, uh, widely held assumption that the human brain controls the body and instead propose that interaction between brain, body, and real world environment are necessary for human intelligence to emerge. And this concept of AI has influenced the creation of biology-inspired robots, from those resembling insects and fish to animals, animaloids, and humanoids. Now, Japanese roboticists were among the first to develop humanoid robots based on the idea of embodied AI. But since the trifold disaster of March 2011, the earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown, the development in Japan of sophisticated but impractical humanoid robots has greatly tapered off and mostly ended. And in any case, they were and are but a fraction of all types of robots, the vast majority of which, 90% uh, plus, are industrial robots. Moreover, from the start, humanoids have not been end products. They are platforms, and many are prototypes. Humanoids are very challenging to make and require many new materials and sensors inspired by humans' ability to touch, see, hear, taste, move, etc. And as you see in this image, the uh, humanoids Pepper and Ashimo 
uh, their sensors and locomotion components have been spun off into other more useful and lucrative AI-based industries. In this case, Pepper has become a vacuum cleaner and Ashimo a, uh, a very fancy wheelchair. But other AI-based industries include cameras, uh, automobiles, satellites that, of course, enable global surveillance, and uh, increasingly weapon systems like drones. Now, I want to move on to my case study of IBO as a secure attainment um, device. And it's worth noting that the market for entertainment robots is a very fast growing one. 11.2 billion in uh, dollars in 2021, and that's expected to grow to reach the value of $60 billion by 2029. Now, as hinted in the image uh, on the poster for this talk, I'm using IBO as representative of these other cute entertainment robots. And I'm using IBO to interrogate the normalization of surveillance as an acceptable and even desired aspect or feature of everyday life and work. Surveillance can be understood as a type of entertainment and not just in the sense of the lighthearted use of a technology or technological systems for the purposes of personal entertainment, amusement, or fun. And so thus in literature and movies, the negative aspects of surveillance, the dark side of Big Brother, so to speak, have been highlighted, for example, in Orwell's 1984 and in the German film, The Lives of Others from 2006. Now on the more positive side, it's equally important to note that the verb to entertain is also used in reference to keeping someone amused, distracted, occupied, and so forth, so that they do not become bored or disinterested. And teachers and parents often feel they have to entertain students and children in this sense. And AI-based edutainment robots are also part of a growing industry. One example is Moxie, as you see here. The robotics company Embodied launched Moxie in 2020, aimed at five to 10-year-old children, especially those on the spectrum who need to develop listening skills and verbal communication. Its app requires a connection to Wi-Fi and an updated smartphone. There are privacy concerns because Embody collects and stores audio and visual and video information so that the robot can recognize and appropriately interact with a given child. And the company, of course, uses that data to improve its own technology. Now, a robot similar to Moxie was brought out 15 years earlier by NEC, a multinational information and technologies uh, and uh, information technology and electronics corporation. And I want to read from the, the PowerPoint. Uh, Papero, or partner type personal robot, is billed as a child care robot. And there have uh, since been produced lighter and smaller models that uh, NEC says will allow family members living apart to watch over each other utilizing the robot in cloud computing technology. Uh, these newest models are stationary. Uh, they have an NTP based app that allows family members to send texts that Papero can even read out loud to elderly parents and uh, grandparents. So in short, Moxie and uh, Papero, like Ibo, are both edutainment and securetainment robots. Let's move to Ibo. Ibo, a robot dog uh, currently in its fourth or fifth uh, generation, was designed and advertised as an entertainment robot and also as a household companion. In the words of Sony's sales staff, Ivo is designed to grow and is, as it is, quote, showered with love as a family member. People naturally open their hearts to Ivo's lovable behavior. And I made two videos uh, last month at the Sony store in Ginza that I would like to uh, share with you. And you're going to be seeing Sakura. The voice you hear is mine. And I'd like you to keep an eye on this uh, video. It's constantly going at the Sony store. Um, and uh, you'll see how the uh, app uh, is used to operate in IBO.
、踊ってもいいわよ。うん、踊っていいわよ。あおいよ。音楽は、音楽は。<笑>よーいどん。So pretty cute.、Uh, the robot dog's name. I wants to keep going here. The robot dog's name was、uh, originally an Anglophone portmanteau from AI Robot. And from 1999 to 2006, was spelled in capital letters. The current generation robot dog's name is spelled in lower case letters. Perhaps in recognition of the lack of capitalization in Japanese and to distinguish the newest model from its ancestors. Sony's copywriters point out the positive homonymic resonances. A resonances of Ibo's name. You have, for example, Ibo is pal or accomplice, and Ibo is love attachment. And、uh, in 2023, Sony's Ibo community website added a second、uh, origin, I plus robot, in reference to the robot dog's upgraded face and location recognition software. <clears throat> Sony's, I,、uh, Sony's robot dogs. Bear the prefix ERS, an acronym for Entertainment Robot System, emphasizing the development of the multiple generations of IBO entertainment robots. Between 1999 and 2006, at least 150,000、uh, IBOs were sold for an average of about、uh, 20, 250,000 yen, or about 3,000 American dollars,、uh, in Japan, Europe, and the United States. In comparison, The number of industrial robots installed worldwide in mostly automotive factories reached over 1 million units in 2006, and nearly 50% were manufactured in Japan. Sony had stopped making the popular Ibo in 2006 and stopped providing replacement parts in 2014. The company claims that it ceased production because Ibo was not profitable, despite earning an estimated $40 million. Based on information from early generation IBO owners, it was more likely the case that Sony was troubled by the discovery that the techie owners were altering their IBOs by exchanging body parts and customizing or hacking the robot dog's behavior. In 2018, Sony decided to revive IBO and brought out a new version of the dog, the ERS 1000. The newest IBO is much more secure, much less hackable, but of course not 100%. Now, in purchasing one, unlike the earlier、uh, generations, in purchasing a new IBO, owners must use and update the dedicated My IBO app necessary for operating the robot dog. Sony also emphasizes in the online help guide that, quote, no answer will be provided by Sony to questions about the contents. Of the software code. They, they want to eliminate anybody from hacking in. The early IBOs, with one less expensive exception you see here at her left, look more like sturdy mechanical dolls,、uh, dogs with a visor instead of eyes. Sony marketed these dogs as a spectacle of high technology that showcased the company's high tech capabilities and products. The newest model IBO, the ERS 1000, Supposedly resembles a Jack Russell Terrier and has softer features around her、uh, head and nose and two expressive eyes. And it also bears an uncanny resemblance to Snoopy, the cartoon Beagle in the Peanuts comic, another widely popular, wildly popular dog in Japan. Now, Sony describes the ERS 1000 as curvy with more active doggy expressions, like tilting its head and shaking its hip, as you saw in my video. Now, generally speaking,、uh, robot eyes are an especially good design practice for fostering a positive perception of a robot. Now, in IBO, the light emitting diodes cap are capable of forming different expressions and give the impression that IBO is making contact with its human、uh, interlocutor. 
even though Ibo does not see with its eyes. Rather, Ibo has a fisheye camera in its nose and a 3D mapping or a SLAM camera in front of its tail. And in case you're wondering, here's how Ibo sees. Here's the scene from the fisheye in the nose and Ibo's algorithms break it down to these digitalized uh, images that allow it then to uh, assess what it is it is looking at. Is it a chair? Is it a human? Uh, and it's all based on, of course, the algorithms and the data sets that have been used to train uh, Ibo. Now, unlike the early Ibo, uh, which were marketed as strictly entertainment robots, the new Ibo is also marketed as a personal and household companion that keeps its human owners happily entertained and secure. It retails today for about 218,000 yen, about 3,000 US dollars. And the required monthly subscription plans and various electronic toys and cute outfits available on Sony's online store add considerably to Ibo's cost. The ERS 1000 model sold in the United States and only in the US, not in Europe this time, comes in three editions, white, dark gray, and pink and four different eye colors. You have uh, blue, orange, or light brown, and pink, and green, which is not shown here. Ibo's aimed at Japanese consumers come in a wider variety of colors, including the classic Jack Russell tricolors, and the newest color that came out this year is um, black, or espresso, and it has blue eyes. And I know from Sony that they're working on a black and white model. Now, altogether, Ibo has nine sensors, four microphones, two cameras, and seven movable parts, the head, mouth, neck, waist, front and back paws, ears, and tail. And all of these work together to provide locomotion and expressive gestures, as you saw in the video. Ibo's lithium battery provides the robot with two hours of continuous activity, including wireless cloud-based Wi-Fi connectivity, before it heads automatically to its uh, cuddler-like recharger for a three-hour nap. And I just want to quickly make a sidebar uh, reference to the energy consumption of surveillance data uh, analysis centers that, of course, the IBO app depends on. So the cloud, which does not look anything like a cloud, uh, now has a greater carbon footprint than the airline industry. A single data center, the largest of which is in China and covers 585,000 uh, square meters, consumes the equivalent electricity of more than 50,000 homes. So collectively, these data centers devour more energy than some nation states. The growing adoption of innovations like generative AI will only accelerate the demand for cloud computing and greatly increase the consumption of energy. Now, IBO sensors, activated via a wireless cloud-based app, enables the dog to respond to petting and standardized vocal commands. And according to Sony, to acquire an identity and personality, depending on its living environment and its relationship with people. Owners can nurture their very own unique Ibo, a personal Ibo, and even set the dog's gender using the My Ibo app. Once selected, Ibo's gender cannot be changed. Gendering affects the pitch of Ibo's voice and the way they move. And you notice Sakura had kind of a high-pitched bark. However, regardless of the assigned gender, all Ibo's are hardwired to urinate by raising a hind leg. The required My Ibo app can be described as an agent of engineered domesticity in the sense that an owner's routine must be choreographed and the interior of their home reconfigured in ways that ensure the predictable and safe operation of the robot dog. Once these routines, floor plans, and furnishings are uploaded and mapped, Ivo can safely roam and with its cameras, create even more detailed visual images and maps of an owner's everyday activities and household effects. These data are stored in the IBO cloud plan maintained by Sony. 
Now note that in addition to allowing owners to use their My, My Ibo app to take pictures through Ibo's camera, Ibo on its own is constantly taking photographs of its surroundings. Thus, a private house becomes a digital enclosure and the interior contents from furniture to family members are converted into digital and biometric data. Ivo captures and stores information about them and their daily activities and effectively turns the private space of the home into a public space in the sense of being tracked by Sony and its affiliates. And a useful analogy is the Amazon eBook. An Amazon eBook collects data in real time about every eBook version and circulation. It tracks which pages are read and reread, how far readers got in the book, and also which passages they highlighted and so on. Now, early generations of Ivo lacked a GPS and could neither track nor be tracked. They were essentially operating in unknown environments within and outside of Japan to the consternation of Sony engineers. The required My Ibo app now allows Sony to control and standardize and to surveil the manner that the robot dog is incorporated into the everyday lives of individual owners and connected physically and vi virtually with their households. For example, the manga or cartoon instructions on Sony's Ibo uh, website in Japan highlight the benefits of eating together with Ibo. A programmed feeding bowl purchased from the online store is displayed on the My Ibo app full of kibble uh, that is being consumed by a virtual Ibo, even though the tangible dog can only stand over an empty bowl and make kibble crunching sounds. The virtual and tangible are conflated. Sony awards frequent My Ibo users uh, and purchasers with virtual gifts, including coins, a type of cryptocurrency. Through the My Ibo app, Ibo community and Facebook websites, and brick and mortar Sony stores, and at Sony's organized fan meetings. Ibo owners are presented with a constantly upgraded and innovative and innovated supply of merchandise. The My Ibo app also enables the nurturing of new abilities and tricks for the robot dog to perform, including patrolling the house and providing security updates via Wi Fi. Sony promotes Ibo as providing not only fun, but also peace of mind and a sense of security and safety, the Anshin Anzen. The app itself makes all of these functions bendy or convenient. So you have bendy anshin anzen. And uh, you see here uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, let's patrol together. You can have Ibo go on, uh, to a specific place by tapping on the image on the map. And of course, the circular image shows Ibo's visual field uh, when patrolling, and that's from its nose camera. A January 2019 news release from Sony announced the launch for Japanese owners of Ibo Patrol in partnership with Secom, a Tokyo-based security company established in 1962 with branches worldwide since 1978. Secom in Japan dominates the security market, providing cameras and other security arrangements through a subscription program. This year, the company earned 1.1 trillion yen, about $7.3 billion. Uh, now together, surveillance and security broadly defined is um, a very lucrative business. Sony's uh, copywriters remind owners that their time with Ivo doesn't just keep you smiling and laughing, it helps you patrol your home while entertaining you. Patrolling is Ibo's first real job, and he's ready to get going. And so these words from the Ibo website capture the triangulation of embodied AI, entertainment, and surveillance. And I translated the Japanese uh, copy for you. Ibo police officer, the Omari-san, is a new service based on the concept of secure attainment, security plus entertainment, 
which provides both fun, but also a sense of security while living with Ivo. Ivo will now be able to patrol your home, looking for people and reporting. This is Ivo's first real job. Now, Sony's American website adamantly stresses that Ivo is not a security system. Because Ivo is in fact, is in effect a biometric surveillance device, its sale and use are prohibited in the state of Illinois and in the city of Baltimore, where strict privacy laws prevent the collection of biometric information. Sony reserves the right to collect data through the My Ivo app and use it for marketing and other purposes unrelated to the actual operation of the robot dog. Data are a very lucrative commodity. Data mining is like mining for gold and data in short are capital. Now, no one questions Ibo's cuteness. However, the adjective kawaii also implies that something or someone, make sure I did the right thing here, uh, is uh, friendly, unthreatening, benign, innocent, childlike, and so forth. Ibo's cuteness detracts from the household robot's real job as a watchdog for both the owner and for Sony, underscoring the dual use of its AI technology, namely entertainment plus facial recognition and location data software. Also highlighted in the press release accompanying Ibo is how the home policing service serves as a solution free of charge for a rise in Japan's elderly population and an accompanying need for security at home. Implied here is the double benefit of providing the 30% of citizens over the age of 70 who live alone with an IBO. So supposedly the robot dog will keep them entertained and will allow their adult children or caregivers to check in on them via the Wi Phone app that they can access uh, from their uh, cell phones. Now, I want to talk a bit more about the My Ibo app, actually about the My prefix. It is the latest iteration of the My loan word formula of My plus noun, dating to the coinage in 1960s of the My home and its systemic extension, My homism, in reference to the new post-war norm of the nuclear uh, family home, like neighborhood associations freed from its wartime status as an imperial state apparatus. The nuclear family households in the Ibo videos discussed earlier are unrepresentative of the average high-rise dwellings in Tokyo and other congested metropoles. And in this context, Ibo is advertised as providing a personalized form of how home security. And you see here Ibo, uh, the YouTube of Ibo patrolling the home. Uh, and they always on these YouTubes feature a very spacious room with a bare floor, minimum clutter, which is not typical of most Japanese uh, homes and living spaces. Videos made by both Sony's public relations staff and um, oh, in the dozens, now let me go back to, let's go back to this picture here. Um, I also want to note that these videos um, that are made both by Ibo fans and uh, also uh, Sony uh, uh, produces these Ibo YouTubes, they have a lot of features in common. Home interiors are almost all neutral colors. Beige is dominant. And historically, uh, beige is a color in Japan with uh, connotations of affluence, calmness, and security. Featured interiors all have wooden or wood-like floors, and as I mentioned, they're uncluttered with a minimum of furnishings, and they're also windowless. There are no obstacles, uh, there are no fringe throw rugs or electrical cords or potted plants for Ibo to get uh, tangled up in or to bang into while walking. So these are all staged interiors and, you know, very different from the typical small cluttered uh, Japanese home. Now, in the dozens of owner-made uh, YouTube videos that I've watched, owners' faces are almost never shown. Perhaps the owners are aware of face recognition privacy issues on the internet. 
Now, apart from the invisible videographer, the presence of humans is only evident when someone extends their hand or their knees uh, into the picture frame to pet Ibo. Owners sometimes speak to Ibo as if the dog were a, uh, as if the robot were a flesh and blood dog, and sometimes eliciting a sharp bark and tail wagging, as you saw in my video of uh, Sakura. As suggested in Sony's online and in-person seminars on the best techniques for photographing and videotaping Ibo, captions and clip art, which you see here, are often added for context and dramatic effects and to convey Ibo's imagined feelings and intentions, as you see in these images. So here, Ibo is raising a paw and saying, oops, kore uh, mite, like, look, ma, no hands. And then in the bottom, motto, motto, as if it wants more petting and stroking. So more and more. The My Ibo app uh, and dozens of official and unofficial YouTube videos of Ibo at home graphically illustrate the most recent phase of the technopolitics of the domestication of dogs, which I uh, unfortunately don't have time to get into, but I have observed in accord with many reports appearing in the Japanese media over the past decade, the correspondence between the declining birth rate and the rising rate of small dog ownership. Now, apropos this trajectory, in March, 2023, Sony's Ibo Community Hub team posted a list of five reasons why you need an Ibo in your life. They are, one, Ibo has ever advancing technology and the fun never stops. Two, Ibo can easily fit any lifestyle, and because you can turn Ibo off, you don't have to sacrifice your job demands or social commitment with this companion. Three, Ibo provides unique companionship, and Ibo will be unlike anyone, and your Ibo will be unlike anyone else's. Four, Ibo costs less than other companions, and five, Ibo is cool. And with Ibo, the future is now. Now, what's clear is how Ibo is marketed by Sony as a prescription for self actualizing and puts a social premium on prioritizing oneself or, writ large, one's family or household. Reference to job demands in this list suggests that my homism, conjoined with Ibo ownership, is an extension of corporate commodity culture. And let me expand on the matter of corporate uh, commodity culture as I conclude my presentation. Perhaps a more incisive term describing what the entire Sony Ibo, uh, Ibo network can constitutes is surveillance capitalism. Now this term was coined by Shoshana Zuboff, a retired Harvard Business School professor who published in 2018 the widely cited book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Zuboff claims that two companies, Google and Facebook, effectively invented surveillance capitalism as a new logic of accumulation. We can add NEC and Sony to this group. And note that over the past decade, NEC in particular has quietly emerged as perhaps the world's largest purveyor of biometric technology. Now, central to Zuboff's concept of surveillance capitalism is that data now operates as a form of capital. According to sociologist Jason Zadowski of Monash University, mass data extraction is the new frontier of accumulation and the next step in capitalism. And it should be clear by now that data sets are the foundational layer that, make in, that makes embodied AI function. And uh, this is uh, emphasized by Kate Crawford in her book, The Atlas of AI. With respect to Sony's IBO collected data, the data itself may be publicly available through shared websites, but the meta value of the data, that is how the data is spun off into other applications, is privately held, in this case by Sony and its corporate affiliates. 
Sony and other companies are import and export very large data sets about their users with the core purpose of making a profit by selling these data to their affiliates and external users, including advertisers. In short, IBO users like Google and Facebook users are both consumers and living data that generate profits for the companies whose apps and services they use and even pay for. It should be the other way around. Consumers should be getting royalties from these companies and we consumers should be outraged. Now, as I noted earlier, humanoids are very challenging to make and are not very practical. Animaloids, like the generations of Ivo, are also very sophisticated machines, but are more practical. Roboticists acknowledge that entertainment robots are much more forgiving than, say, industrial robots, whose movements must be absolutely precisely coordinated with the task at hand. Mistakes made by entertainment robots can actually add to their cuteness and adorability and provide roboticists with real world data as opposed to lab-based data. And of course they use this data to incorporate into updated hardened software. Sony elicits such real world feedback from IBO owners uh, on many occasions, including at the annual official fan club meetings. In connection with the concept of surveillance capitalism, Sony's diligent and dedicated cultivation of IBO fans also helps to deflect critical scrutiny from the company's data marketing strategies and practices. Sony is one of the major corporations that have built their business models around consumers' personal data. And this PowerPoint is an image uh, I took um, of a YouTube. It's a very inform uh, informative article on Sony's, Sony's uh, consumer-oriented data collecting and marketing. Uh, Sony and its counterparts know that no matter how much they know about their consumers, in this case, IBO owners, their products will not be purchased unless they make consumers happy and their lives better. So the patrol, the IBO patrol service, addresses and exploits the public opinion surveys that suggests that a critical mass of consumers in Japan is fearful of crime. And so Sony capitalizes on this, as does SECOM. The responsible and ethical use of AI and embodied AI must begin with mystifying AI and data and countering consumer ignorance about data mining. Earlier, I invoked the ubiquitous buzzword in security camera and entertainment robot marketing, benni anshin anzen, or convenient peace of mind safety. Uh, there is a lot of inconvenient and a lot of uncomfortable thinking that all of us have to do about the places and the extent of surveillance in our daily lives if we are to cultivate and achieve a more profound consciousness of peace of mind, safety, and security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Robertson, for uh, your insightful talk and for, the, for sharing your new research, which is really close to our everyday life. And you gave uh, a lot to talk about, to think about. Uh, so now I will we will have a commentary by Professor Itazi. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's, okay, there we go. Thank you for your kind introduction, Dr. Balzavi. I'm Yoko Itazi. I'm uh, from the Interfaculty Initiative on Information Studies. I serve as the uh, director of the BI Global Forum, and. Uh, we are, um, I'll, I won't say too much about the BI Global Forum today, but we're interested in the history before AI, uh, industrial structure behind AI, the societal infrastructure beneath AI, and what lies behind AI. These are the kinds of things we're interested in and we're, when we're talking about the social implications of AI. We are delighted to be co-hosting this event along with Tokyo College today. And we'd like to thank Professor Haneda, Professor Mino, and everyone at Tokyo College for making this such an enjoyable collaboration. We look forward to having more collaborations like this in the future.
As a longtime admirer of Professor Robertson's work, I'm honored to be having to have this opportunity to be the discussant today. It was particularly meaningful that I'm able to comment on this that this talk that sits in the intersections between social robots, entertainment, and the exertion of power, which are themes I'm also interested in. There were many things that I found insightful and stimulating about this talk on the fusion of the embodied AI, entertainment, and surveillance. But to begin with, I, I really appreciated how Professor Robertson expanded the notion of securitainment in this talk. Um, previous iterations of, of the word securitainment have been used to discuss how national security is depicted in television drama and movies. So securitainment in this way is a way to educate citizens about the importance of national security through the medium of popular culture. TV shows about the CIA or other intelligence services disseminates images and spread narratives about how the intelligence community functions and how they play a necessary role in protecting its citizens. Famously, Ben Affleck's movie Argo from 2016, I believe, was a story that the State Department was keen for Hollywood to tell. Um, it was about the Iranian hostage crisis. Argo is an example of securitainment in this earlier meeting. What Professor Robertson does with her insightful analysis of Ibo is add a, a different dimension to the term securitainment. Rather than entertainment for promoting national security, Professor Robertson discusses people being entertained by robots with a surveillance function. Professor Robertson's new meaning to this word works very well as a description of a growing scholarship on surveillance culture and its subgenre of using surveillance for entertainment. For example, using home security videos or CCTV feeds for entertainment is something that we've become familiar with. If we go on social media, we see clips of funny things that were caught on home security cameras. And during the pandemic, I was certainly entertained and comforted by watching CCTV footages of some mountain village in Canada, or even just watching the Shibuya Scramble Crossing. <laughs> so what, the other thing that gives uh, richness to Professor Robertson's analysis of Ibo is of course her perceptive understanding of the historical transformations of the Japanese societal networks. This distinguishes her analysis from many of the other studies that it are emerging in the field of human AI interaction. There are lots of things that I like to discuss today, but um, three things um, I like to discuss in particular, as I listed on the slides. The extent of security, surveillance of, and security, and the relationship between the domestic space and surveillance capitalism. So on to my first question. My first question is to do with Ibo's function as a security robot. What strikes me as interesting is that Ibo's ability to actually secure safety is rather limited. Ibo can see, but it's not going to bark at intruders. I'm assuming that if an intruder covers the eyes or the nose of Ibo, or just breaks it, it will lose its power to actually patrol uh, the, the home. I also learned from the, from the manufacturer's website that when it's on patrol mode, the default setting is for it to go back to its charging station. If the user wishes to activate an actual patrol movement, it needs to be instructed by the user and specifically told to go from point A to point B. From what I can see, the security camera is not even promoting the eyeball tie up as a means to stop burgl burglary. In short, there seems to be far better home security systems for the home than eyeball. Given these facts, it seems abundantly clear that the benefit of eyeball's eyes or nose um, <laughs> being able to see is far greater for the manufacturer collecting this data rather than the end user. 
if we think about who can see what is recorded by the camera or the nose, whether whether it's a home security system, uh, if it's a home security system, it will be able to be accessed by the user. Whereas when IBO is seeing, um, it's not really being, it, it's not really accessible by the user unless they are using the IBO as an avatar, as a human avatar for when they are away. I'm happy to be corrected if, if my understanding is incorrect mm -hmm. on that point. Another interesting fact is that while the security and entertainment functions are fused into one robot in IBO, it seems that it can only do one thing at a time. When it's being a source of entertainment as a pet, the human user is also at home, so it doesn't really need, um, it doesn't need to be used as a security system. When it's serving as a patrol system, it doesn't necessarily function as entertainment because the human isn't there to play with it. So IBO serves these functions consecutively, but never simultaneously, as far as I can tell. IBO can alternate its functions or perhaps alternate its identity, but it can be either a security camera or a social pet, but never at the same time. IBO is like Superman. It can't be Clark Kent and Superman at the same time. So I wonder what the significance of this means. It's rather interesting that it, it can only change its gender once, but it's able to switch back and forth numerous times between being a patrol device and a service, a social pet. What does this say about the humans designing this device? Um, I think in Japan, we love multi-purpose spaces, multifunctional objects. Would I be overacting to think that there's something culturally significant in seeing how these two separate functions are merged into one device? My second question is to do with Ben Dian Shin Anzen, the peace of mind, safety, and security. Given the limited abilities that IBO has to provide security and the fact that the camera is far more useful for the manufacturer's data collection than for the user, I wonder if we can unpack the concept of peace of mind, safety, and security in IBO. I believe the primary point that Professor Robertson is making is that the concept of bendi anshin anzen or anshin anzen bendi is appropriated as a rhetorical tool for the normalization of surveillance. That is to quote, deflect critical scrutiny, unquote, and make sure that, uh, make surveillance as quote, uh, an acceptable and even desired aspect of everyday life, unquote. And I'm wondering here that I think, uh, I think you might be implying that there might be a transformation in the ideas behind Anshin, Anzen, and Bendi. In addition to that appropriation, I think there's perhaps another uh, dimension. Um, uh, so, so what I mean by that is you talk about how I, uh, it's Ibo's cuteness that detracts attention from the watchdog and makes it acceptable makes it an acceptable robotic pet. Um, Ibo is not actually providing real security for the user in the sense, in the English language sense that it's protecting from risk or danger. Instead, if we're looking for the Bendi Anshi and Anzen of Ibo, perhaps it's more of a psychological and emotional support for the humans. The peace of mind, safety and security comes from its cuteness as a non-human inanimate object, it seems. Is it possible to argue that Ibo is a robot? Um, Ibo as a robot is more convenient, it is safe, and it gives a peace of mind for people who want to mitigate risks and responsibilities that come with interhuman relationships, or even actually taking care of real live animals. Is it possible to think that this is a transformative moment that signals another phase in the conceptual life of the Bendi Anshin Anzen rhetoric? 
That was my second question. And this is my last question. Um, my last question is about domestic space and surveillance capitalism in Japan. Unlike live pet dogs, I'm guessing Aibo does not like sand. Given that it's a precision machinery with intricate parts and mechanical joints, Aibo probably isn't the best thing to take out uh, to play at the park or in the sandbox. Not to mention its narcoleptic tendencies to fall asleep after two hours. In other words, it seems like a robot that works well only in the indoor space or as you say, at home. And if we agree that IBO surveillance function is more beneficial to the manufacturer than the consumer, um, I like to ask question, I, I like to ask the question um, in relation to the impact of surveillance capitalism in the Japanese context. In particular, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the impact of securitainment robots, especially in the domestic sphere, as it as an enabler of Japanese corporate capitalism. As we know, workers are already expected to give so much to corporate Japan. Long working hours, convenient contracts for the organizations, such as discretionary hours, zero hour contracts, strong expectations of loyalty and dedication to corporations that really come at the expense of family ties and puts emotional strains on interpersonal relationships. School clubs, uh, school club cultures or bukatsu prepare children to go into corporate Japan by making them prioritize club activities over family schedules, which somehow families also accept. So what do you think are the ramifications of these types of surveillance capitalism, especially uh, this kind of surveillance capitalism, especially in Japan, where conformism, uh, uh, conformism and corporate driven logic run society? Already there's such a deep rooted use of technology for the sake of maintaining patriarchal hegemony in Japan, as you beautifully demonstrated in your book, Robo Sapiens Japanicus. This is just another step in that direction. And, we, and when we think about similar comfort robots, such as Rovot or Paro, are they all functioning towards a similar goal of maintaining this patriarchal corporate culture in Japan? I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Stop sharing my slides. Can I share my slides uh, again? Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay, great. I wanted to bring back because I you mentioned uh, in in closing Lovett and um, Pato, and I, I wanted to be sure that people uh, knew what those robots uh, look like. Um, but I'll get back to them uh, in a minute. Thank you so much for your um, very uh, insightful uh, comments and um, also your close reading of, of my paper on the sex, uh, you know, with your own uh, remarkable research on AI and the leisure industry. Uh, can I go through your questions one by one? I, and I uh, actually wrote out some responses ahead of time, you know, in the interest of saving a little bit of time. Uh, so we can open up to uh, some of our um, uh, internet viewers. Um, with respect to IBO's <laughs> limited function of security robot, um, I think what's important here is that uh, IBO owners have access to what IBO is seeing through their smartphones, and they can also communicate through IBO. So it's not. Oh, the, so it's not so much um, a, um, a, an avatar as Ibo through the smartphone and the My Ibo app exists as a way in which the human owner can extend you know, their, their, uh, their authority and their influence and make connections with even a third party. Uh, for example, communicating with an elderly parent at home uh, through Ibo uh, would work. Um, the other thing that's important with respect to IBO as a security device is that, as I mentioned, security cameras in general do not do crimes, uh, you know, whether they bark or not. 
Um, some criminals might see a sign that says, you know, the security camera in operation, but that won't necessarily stop them from actually committing a crime. And so the usefulness of these cameras is on identifying and uh, locating alleged criminals. Uh, in the case of IBO, uh, again, getting back to one of the functions that Sony would like to um, have IBO users and potential buyers think about is to give an IBO to their, say, elderly parents uh, so that the parents can be entertained and at the same time through the My IBO app and the, cell and the smartphone, uh, the uh, adult offspring can actually look in on uh, what their parents are doing and they can even uh, use uh, IBO as a kind of a telephone if there needed to be any kind of communication. So this jumps ahead to your other uh, question about the separation of IBO's you know, patrol versus entertainment functions. They're actually collapsed, um, one and the same thing. And remember, uh, the IBO owner is not only taking photographs through the My IBO app, IBO is doing it on its own. You know, Sony has IBO taking pictures all the time and collecting uh, essentially owner unauthorized um, biometric data that then uh, goes to the cloud and becomes metadata um, with a meta value for uh, Sony. And this, I'm not so sure that IBO owners are entirely aware of. Or if they are, as one IBO owner said, well, yeah, you know, but IBO is kind of cute and it's so much fun. Um, what can I do? You know, what isn't under surveillance these days? Uh, so, uh, so I think I, I also got uh, I answered the question about um, the the you know the collapse of the security uh, and surveillance and also um, the entertainment function. Uh, I think the link up with SECOM is really important because in addition to IBO as a patrol officer, Omari-san, uh, SECOM also provides the video doorbell, the intercom system, and of course you can contact SECOM directly or an alarm you know, that is part of the AI-based um, uh, security uh, equipment in place will notify SECOM, who then can notify the police if there's anything amiss at a particular household. So it, it's one big package. And doubtless, Sony itself has used SECOM, you know, for its own purposes outside of uh, just simply, uh, you know, attracting uh, more IBO owners. In terms of um, Anqin Anzen, and I'm just surprised, every, you know, if you watch TV and if you go to Big Camera and look at their their security camera section, Anzin, Anzin, uh, Anshin are the most you know uh, prevalent uh, buzzwords used uh, in the advertising. And I think it's as you said, um, it's necessary to think of security here in psychological terms. So your 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 point was actually exactly uh, the one uh, I was making. So Anshin or comfortable, a feeling of peace. Um, itself is the outcome of a kind of safety and security that is offered by knowing that someone is watching over you. The surveillance aspect of uh, not only IBO, but uh, possibly uh, SECOM. And finally about, um, you know, unla unlike you mentioned, uh, you know, flesh and blood dogs, uh, no, sand is not good for <laughs> IBO's uh, joints. Uh, but you can take it outside. You can take it outside and put it on tarp or short grass. And certainly the early generation IBO owners did adjust that. And, you know, they were also exchanging body parts and hacking into, so into IBO's uh, software and changing its personality, which, uh, you know, freaked Sony out, basically. But the uh, point is, is that no matter where the IBO is, it's constantly transmitting uh, photographs, and uh, biometric and other personal and household specific data, whether indoors or outdoors, and that these and other companies are then harvesting these data, uh, these data to sell, uh, to use in improving a given product, or uh, in the case of Sony, using this kind of data to uh, file for, um, you know, enhanced characters uh, in their PlayStation, um, you know, video games. 
um, advertisers use this kind of data to target households and individuals. Uh, you know that if you purchase something on the internet, the next thing you know, you're getting all this you know, junk mail for uh, similar kinds of products. And that's why I offered the uh, Amazon ebook as a good example of the combination of entertainment and data, data harvesting. You read a book for pleasure, but at the same time, Amazon is collecting uh, incredibly fine-tuned data on um, your reading habits and uh, even which page you're turning at what time. So it's a bit mind boggling. Your personal reading habits have become Amazon's uh, big business. Uh, the what is dangerous about this is when uh, or if uh, governments collude with surveillance capitalist companies and the big ones are Google and Amazon, but you need to add NEC and Sony to this mix in the name of security. And so, for example, surveillance systems already in place to monitor, say, terrorism could then be turned against citizens if the democratic commitment to personal civil, civil liberties is ignored or abandoned. And so these global corporations that monopolize biometric data, uh, really, I think uh, the time has come for them to be broken up through antitrust measures and regulated by international laws. I mean, people have been calling for this with respect to Google and Amazon. Um, now, the EU is much more protective and, and, and is much more, I'm sorry, proactive than the United States, with the exception of Illinois or Baltimore. Uh, Japan only recently is starting to get on the proactive bandwagon in terms of the abuses of uh, AI and its surveillance capacities. Nothing has been ratified yet. So this is an ongoing uh, 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 debate. I think that scholars such as yourself and, and, and certainly uh, government officials need to, and corporate officials need to be uh, talking about. Now with respect to just very quickly, uh, Pato and Lovett, they, these are very different uh, robots. I mean, um, Pato was created in 2001 by uh, Shibata Takanori, whom I know, uh, based at the National Institute of Advanced Science uh, and Technology in Tsukuba. And um, it has five kinds of sensors. It can recognize light and dark. It can recognize faces and, um, and uh, voices. Uh, it can respond to being stroked or hit, uh, you know, or beaten. Um, but it, it really isn't connected to the Wi-Fi or cloud, and it's used primarily as a um, way in which um, the elderly and perhaps cognitively impaired residents of nursing homes uh, can use Pato as a form of uh, eliciting communication among themselves, as you see here in the lower photo. Also, because it has antibiotic fur, it can be used in hospitals uh, in the case of children who are undergoing cancer therapy and and need to be in a, a, a you know, hermetically sealed uh, room. Lovat um, is the brainchild of um, the, uh, I forgot his name, um, Kaname Hayashi, who started Groove X, which is a 2015 startup sort of modeled after uh, Silicon Valley. It is, um, much more expensive than IBO, actually. It's uh, like four times as expensive as uh, IBO and has touch sensors all over its body. Uh, it um, has, um, you know, AI features uh, such as, you know, the generative AI and the voice synthesizer. Um, it uh, is a very uh, simple kind of rudimentary a robot, it's got a plastic body, it rolls on wheels, and it, it, it's, uh, its huggableness, I guess you could say, is provided by this sort of um, hoodie kind of sock you put over to, that hides its you know, plasticky um, uh, body parts. But what's interesting, and that uh, I had to look into a little bit, is it has, Groove X has just um, gotten into a partnership with Taiwan based Cyberlink, which provides hardware and software. And because the robot Love It is usually looking up at people, um, it can identify individuals at an angle, which enhances the development of face recognition and surveillance software. 
And this, I believe, is going to be how GrooveX is going to make its money, not through selling uh, the Love It robot. I mean, Sony is a far bigger multinational company with infinite resources. It really assiduously cultivates its um, IBO owners and fans. And, uh, you know, through organized fan meetings, through eliciting uh, uh, suggestions from fans for new colors, you know, new uh, Ibo uh, merchandise, and so on and so forth. And you know, Groovex simply can't do this. So I think we, you know, under the radar. I think Groovex is doing something other than just you know providing people with an alternative to uh, Ibo. And I'll stop there. But thank you very much. I, I hope I answered some of your questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, can I just follow up with one quick yes, of course, comment? Of course, sure. Great, thank you. Um, uh, yes, definitely. I think um, that provided a lot more additional context, um, and I think I've improved my understanding. The one thing that I just wanted to mention now was um, one of the earlier points you just made mm -hmm. was about how Ibo is used for uh, to monitor elderly parents yeah and it can be it wants it. it it's suggesting that this is a possible use right yeah. and i just wonder about this form of surveillance and i understand that it's called care-based surveillance yeah. because it's about you know caring for somebody else yeah. uh, it might be elderly parents it might be some like children or whatever but um i just wonder whether whether we need to consider this as a form of a legitimate voyeurism because if the parents who are being monitored have no say in when they're being monitored um, it seems a little bit problematic to me but well, I, I don't know whether you have any more yeah it's very experience. problematic and uh, you know this is part I cut actually because I was talking about other things but uh, yeah, I'm not so sure that uh, this has been um, very much discussed, um, not only by roboticists, uh, certainly not by Sony's engineers um, or by IBO owners. Um, I think there needs to be, and you know, hopefully webinars like this one will get people to think a little bit more critically about how these seemingly benign and cute devices that seem to offer the socially responsible solutions to you know, elder care, child care, you know, home monitoring, whatever, um, have a, a disturbing sort of big brother viristic, you know, side to it. And they need to start learning about how the cloud operates. Uh, they need to start learning what exactly AI is instead of just taking it for granted or leaving it self-evident. And they need to understand how surveillance itself um, is a very lucrative industry for these companies um, by virtue of the fact that the users are providing for free um, biometric data that is then turned into capital. Uh, so by children, these companies. yes, right. Yeah. So the children are complicit. They are absolutely complicit. Everybody's complicit. And I think that's what I said should outrage us. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you. So, I'll stop yeah, there. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you. Um, so we have only five minutes left. So maybe we have uh, time for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if I, I can choose or uh, you want to choose. <laughs> oh gosh, let's see. Now we are thinking we were we were uh, you were talking about security so maybe the the third one yeah the third well yes the one from Anna yes I think I I answered that in that you know people have to become a lot more um, exercise much more scrutiny about the devices they use like I always close the camera on my laptop not many people do but as we're using our laptop we are being you know incorporated into the cloud. Um, you know, it does, it exhausts you to think of how many, um, you know, apart from just getting off the grid entirely, uh, how do you protect yourself? And here's where, where governments, I think, really do need to step in. If the state of Illinois can do it, uh, surely, you know, the, um, you know, nation state governments can do it. Uh, in terms of the legal status of facial recognition technology, um, the, it's, 
if you look at the personal um, in, uh, facial recognition website, you can only access the nitty gritty data in Japanese, but um, the government is more concerned about businesses, although they haven't ratified anything yet. And they're telling basically home and small shop owners to well use your discretion. I, in other words, if you have a security camera mounted on your uh, gate or your door, don't point it in the direction of your neighbors. But if you do, that's your business. We're not going to, no. you know, we don't have any way of, um, of patrolling and, and preventing that. Uh, in terms of um, CCTV cameras installed and reduced the crime rate, yeah, surveillance itself cannot protect people. It can sometimes serve as a deterrent, but it's usually used, uh, certainly if you watch any detective shows, used to track down and to place. Uh, alleged criminals at, at in certain locations at certain times, and therefore build a case that will allow you know the police and law enforcement to prosecute them. So cameras themselves uh, really don't uh, do too much, and if people tend to take their presence for granted. You know, it's really you know they're not even going to notice that they're there. Um, and let's see, the shape of the robot can contribute to how it's accepted. Um, yes, the shape is important not only for reasons um, that Pfeiffer and Bongard point out in their book about you know how intelligence can be um, can be artificially you know constructed uh, in the sense of machine learning, but also you know if uh, if a say embodied device isn't cute uh, or isn't diminutive, uh, it's not likely going to be very useful for people uh, in their homes or as something that they can hold and carry, um, which is why, um, you know, so many of these so-called Rusuban robots or the, um, you know, watchdog uh, house-sitting robots are, are very tiny and unobtrusive. Um, the ones with an entertainment function uh, uh, equally uh, are not threatening because they are uh, small and cute and have, um, you know, uh, adorable behaviors that you can uh, program, you know, in this, in the case of Ibo through the My Ibo app, and you can create Ibo's personality that way. Okay. I think we managed to go <laughs> through all that. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't have uh, any more time. So okay. I would like to uh, wrap up today's session. Uh, so I would like to co close uh, today's event and to thank once again, Professor Robertson, uh, Professor Itatsu, and Beyond AI, as well as the audience for uh, joining us and staying with us. You can Thank find you. latest information on of Tokyo College on our website, uh, Mail Magazine, social media profile. And I hope you can uh, join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.